This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. No, I'm not going to argue that this is a Gothic text. Uh, I came across it in connection with some other Gothic research I was doing, but this one isn't in the, in the category. Um, so the name of the novel I'm talking about is Esas Mujeres Rubias, which means those blonde women. And there's a handout going round which gives you the bibliography and the quotations I will use in the sequence. So I'll use them so I won't keep saying number blah on the handout, but you'll see it there in front of you. So this is a contemporary Spanish novel presented as a mother's first person account of her life to date, including losing her only daughter, Alma, at the age of 14 due to a condition called diamond black fan anemia. It's quite a long and complex novel with an extended subplot and intertextual references to Frances Hodgson Burnett's The Secret Garden reflecting the fact that Hodgson Burnett suffered the loss of an adolescent child of her own, in her case a son Lionel, who died of tuberculosis. Even though Esas Mujeres is presented as having been triggered by the narrator's bereavement and is arguably an extended meditation upon that, its causes and its effects, I think it would be equally accurate to characterise the novel as a study of three generations of mothers. Maria, the narrator in the present day, Carmela, her mother in the Franco years, and Anselma, her grandmother before that. As far as the facts of the plot are concerned, the three women have had very different experiences of mothering and motherhood. Anselma, the grandmother, bore seven children in a remote fishing village, of whom Carmela was the last and only survivor, since all the other six died of an unidentified illness in infancy. Carmela herself has raised two healthy children, first a son and then her daughter, our narrator, Maria, while working as a hairdresser in Madrid. And Maria sacrifices both developing a career and keeping her marriage together in order to prioritise looking after her ailing child full time and managing the latter's treatment programme which precludes a normal life for her, the mother, just as much as for the child. She mentions an average of 12 uh, inpatient stays in hospital per year and uh, homeschooling, for example. Considered rationally, these three women have all tried to be good mothers in their different circumstances and therefore do not deserve to be held responsible for what has gone wrong with their respective children's lives. And yet, at a more emotional level, the reader is aware of a heavy burden of guilt and sense of blame that all three carry and which it is all too easy to internalise without challenge. This paper will explore the presentation of mother blame and guilt in the novel and try to decide whether these are constants in our cultural conceptualization of motherhood so that the changes in models that we see in the novel emerge as cosmetic rather than actually updating meaningfully the position of the mother in society. Certainly, we can find real-life evidence of present date to support the contention that, I quote, although fathers are quite important for the success or failure of their children, mothers are seen as ultimately responsible for the way their children turn out. Research by Nancy Chodoro and many others has accounted for the prevalence of mother blame coming from both feminists and anti-feminists on the basis of, I quote, 
infantile fantasies of maternal omnipotence and a culturally child-centered perspective. The psychoanalytic discourse in this area is complex and I'm not going to challenge it in this paper. It certainly seems plausible to me that the near universal experience of being mothered has driven the development of ideas about motherhood embedded in areas as diverse as the religious doctrine and public health policies which I'm going to focus on in this paper. For its part, research in the field of disability studies has recognized that the cultural meaning of being the mother of a disabled child in particular has evolved over time and varies in different communities and parts of the world. It has been argued by scholars in this field that scientific advances and consumer culture have together increased mothers' sense of blame when they have a disabled child. This paper is going to call that into question, positing that the religious discourse, which the scientific one has uh, replaced in secular society, uh, results in an entirely analogous and equally pernicious phenomenon of mother blame, <coughs> albeit on a different basis, and that Esas Mujeres Rubias illustrates the point vividly. A scholar called Gail Landsman is worth quoting by way of introduction here. Although her research relates to a study conducted in the United States, it seems applicable to the developed world in general and summarizes the basis for mother blame in its secular modern day form. She says, reproduction has been culturally understood in the United States as a form of production. In this line of reasoning, mothers of children with disabilities are the producers of defective merchandise. With motherhood now a choice, each child born must be worth it. She continues, all women in the study felt society's placement of responsibility on them for their child's disability and some personally accepted a level of blame. The study not only demonstrates, she says, that mothers' access to an informed choice allows blame to be placed on them, but also contains an implicit assumption that the birth of a child with a disability requires assignment of blame. What strikes me in all of these quotes is the absence of the mention of fathers here, since they have also um, gone halfway towards producing these children in question. Now both Anselma and Maria have to deal with the fact that they have produced children who have not survived to adulthood. Anselma's belief system is structured around her Catholic faith, which offers her both comfort and grounds for blame internalized as self-blame. On the positive side, she can and does attribute the six deaths to God's inscrutable will. The Lord took them away without explaining why. She can and does believe her babies have gone straight to heaven. She can and does give them a Christian burial, visit their graves and pray for them. And she has the positive value that Christian tradition places on human suffering generally and resignation to that with the hope that it may be rewarded in the hereafter. However, that same belief system also entails the idea that God punishes sinners and their offspring. Indeed, her father, killed by a lightning bolt, is seen as having been struck down in punishment for his own godlessness. So the question implicitly posed for Anselma is what has she done to deserve such terrible divine retribution? And if a just God is punishing her for her father's sins, as Carmela says she believed, does that imply that she does in fact carry some of the blame for them in God's eyes? And Selma, we are indeed told, I quote, took the blame for everything. 
And this, it seems, is also the whispered verdict in the community. The local gossips, sympathetic to her face, I quote, blamed her under their breath for so much misfortune. Whilst she may not have lived at a time which gave her a choice of whether or not to have children, pre-contraception, the Christian doctrine of free will crucially gives all human beings a choice between good and evil, a choice over which she may have tortured herself as she examined her conscience and asked herself why God was taking away her children one after the other. As Badinter puts it, I quote, how was a woman to know if she had adequately expiated her sins, sacrificed enough of herself to fulfill her maternal duties? The answer was supplied by her child, since the child's physical and moral destiny depended entirely upon her, he would be the sign, sexist language there being bad and tales, not mine, he or she would be the sign, the living proof of her virtue or vice, her victory or her failure. And this is what we see in the case of Anselma. No blame or guilt of any kind seems to attach to the children's father. Two generations later, Maria also feels guilty when Alma is born and one thumb is found to be missing. This is before they, they realize she has diamond black fan anemia. They just see this one physical disability. In the hospital just after she's born, we're told that I rocked her to a one-word lullaby. Sorry, sorry, sorry. But in the absence of religious faith and living in contemporary Madrid, Maria looks to a different kind of narrative to cope with her daughter's disability and premature death. First of all, it seems logical to assume that the genetic anomaly which caused Alma's diamond black fan anemia was the same as the unidentified cause of the multiple deaths of her mother's siblings, meaning that her genes, rather than her husband's, are the source of the condition. This offers her scope to blame herself, her mother and her grandmother for their and her own genes as well as for not trying to find out more about the cause of the infant deaths in the previous generation before getting pregnant herself. This latter cause is more rational, of course, than the former one, but I don't think less powerful, one less powerful than the other for that. However, the pattern of blame is complicated by the fact that her husband, Fernando, the father of Alma, has been raised by a single mother and discloses almost nothing, maybe out of his own lack of knowledge, maybe not, we never find out, about his father and his paternal inheritance. So we know nothing about his paternal genes. Before and throughout the pregnancy, Carmela had nagged at Maria to ask Fernando about this and talked about the wisdom of screening couples for anomalies before they have children. But Maria ignored it all. And this leaves her with further scope for self-blame. She didn't listen to her mother's advice. This is the kind of thing, I suppose, that Landsman is talking about in the quotations I, I gave at the beginning. The doctors stress that this condition need not be inherited at all and that even if it has been in Alma's case, it's nobody's fault. But Maria nevertheless believes that it's her biology which has sentenced her daughter to an early death. Biology which she might have been able to do something about if she had investigated beforehand. And once again, there's no textual evidence that Fernando is troubled by any feelings of this kind. What little comfort she can take in her secular context has to come from the fact that once Alma is diagnosed, she and Fernando sought the best medical advice and treatment there was, thanks to which she survived 14 years rather than dying in infancy like her mother's siblings. 
and she also gets some help from medication that she's using at the time of narration to sleep. So Maria's sources of comfort, as well as blame and self-blame, derive principally from doctors and modern medicine rather than the church. But I would argue, leave her with an analogous mixture of terrible sadness and guilt with which she has to learn to live following a failed suicide attempt just after Alma's death. And so what about Carmela, who's in the middle? She's, I think, the most complex character in the novel, mainly because Maria's attitude to her evolves in the course of it, and readers therefore need to keep adjusting and readjusting their reading of her. At first, she seems irritatingly self-confident and self-satisfied, as well as being antipathetically pretentious and a social climber. Self-doubt, let alone guilt or self-blame, are nowhere to be seen at this stage. By the end of the text, however, we understand her very differently. Frightened that she would be unable to produce viable children when she was first pregnant, and after they were born, frightened that they might die inexplicably in infancy, like her six siblings. This is what she says on the subject, eventually. Before Jaime was born, that's the son, I couldn't sleep. I was so frightened that what happened to my mother would happen to me. When he was born, so fair, uh, very, pallor is one of the symptoms of this condition, and she and her mother have extraordinarily blonde hair and fair skin, particularly striking in a country like Spain, of course. When he was born so fair, I spent the first three years watching him, staring at him, clinging to him. And then you came along, she's talking to Maria. So different, so dark, and nothing like us, it was a relief. I began to think it was over. At home it had never been mentioned. Nowadays people talk about everything, to their children, to any stranger. But back then, neither my father nor my mother referred to those children, except to pray for their little souls, or twice a year to visit the cemetery on the Day of the Dead and of the Holy Innocents. Notice once again the mention um, of fathers here being conspicuous by its absence as far as um, Maria's father is concerned. Now not only thanks to this revelation but also through equally uh, through easily missed or misinterpreted remarks earlier on in the text, we come to realise that there's a legacy of anxiety and guilt which Carmela must have been carrying all her life. For example, Maria tells us that she, I quote, acted defensive whenever an outsider pried into family history. When we first read this, we think it's because she's such a social climber, she doesn't want people to realise how humble her background is, but later on we think differently about it. And similarly, she reacts angrily when one of Alma's doctors tries to question her about the family's past history, and again when an academic wants to research the life of the grandfather struck by lightning. Maria thinks she only agrees to meet this academic out of guilt, she did not dare refuse out of a strange guilt feeling. This goes some way towards explaining her excessive attention to keeping up appearances, initially presented to us as a sign of her shallow and affected character, but later emerging as far more understandable and forgivable. She is, after all, of the generation that was taught to respond to guilty memories of Civil War atrocities via willful oblivion, the so-called forgetfulness pact, the Pacto de Olvido. That least said, soonest mended mentality, which as we have seen she defends explicitly, reminds us that not showing one's feelings is not the same as not having any. Carmela too then is surely suffering a sense of guilt and blame for Alma's genetic heritage passed down through her and the devastating effect it has had on her own daughter's life. She may also 
have a double dose here, the vestiges of the religious doctrine of divine retribution being carried down the generations, having been brought up in such a devout family. We know there's a crucifix above her bed and she attends midnight mass at Christmas, for example. Her present to the newborn Alma of a pair of mittens should be seen in this context. She justifies it, saying that all babies wear them so they don't scratch themselves. But Maria Fernando and the reader can see that her aim is to cover up the baby's disability, the missing thumb. And while the internal characters respond very negatively, the father says she's not going to wear them, etc., the reader can perhaps be a little more charitable realizing it's just one more manifestation of her general attitude of keeping up appearances, putting on a brave face, burying whatever is painful to confront, the classic Franco-era policy in other words, even if it's now discredited. That we are likely to have internalized these irrational feelings of guilt and self-blame on the mother's parts without even noticing we have done so is borne out by the fact that the ending of the novel seems a surprise one, bringing us face to face with our unconscious assumptions in this regard. We already know that the genetic origin of Alma's condition, if hereditary at all, may derive from Fernando's paternal side as well as Maria's, or even instead of, and we now learn that even if it is the maternal line, as seems most likely, it's almost bound to be attributable to father-daughter child abuse on the part of Anselma's father, the grandmother's father, incest of which she was the product. So there's a gender reversal in the causal chain that emerges at the novel's denouement seems to have its source in the father's uh, incest. And the fact that this reads like a surprise revelation throws into relief how much we still take for granted unconsciously that mothers create their children and are wholly responsible for the result. Unlike Anselma, Maria gives birth in a modern hospital, anaesthetized with an epidural. She goes to Brussels with Fernando and Alma to see an international expert in diamond black van anemia. And her care of her daughter involves managing the latest drug therapies and blood transfusions, thanks to all of which Alma lives 14 years rather than dying in infancy. That's different from her grandmother's fate and suggests medical progress of a tangible kind. So I think it remains debatable how preferable all of it is for Maria. She hates feeling like an object on a conveyor belt when she goes into labour, and Alma's survival for 12 years more than in Carmela's untreated generation, though of course beyond price for both her and her mother, is nevertheless blighted by frequent invasive hospital treatments and puts pressure on Maria and Fernando's marriage, which leads to its breakdown. The development of contraception also means that Maria and Fernando need to make a conscious joint decision about whether to have more children, another mixed blessing in their case, since they disagree and Fernando prevails leaving Maria effectively as powerless to control her own fertility as her grandmother had been, and with perhaps just as guilty a conscience, in her case for not investigating the cause of the infant deaths in her mother's generation before becoming pregnant. The main reason she wants to have another child is to produce a bone marrow donor for Alma, but Fernando's not having any of it. The science may have moved on, in other words. Maria even suggests IVF to Fernando if he no longer wants to have sex with her. But he won't have that either. The old power balance, in other words, in this marriage hasn't shifted an ounce and is in fact further weighted against the mother by the fact that Alma's care programme, for which Maria unhesitatingly shoulders sole responsibility, and in so doing reminds us of the endurance of the assumption of maternal self-sacrifice. This prevents her developing a career, 
something that might have served to empower her vis-à-vis -vis her husband and in her own eyes. Even though she derived some relief from her own pain after Alma's death by immersing herself in a translation of the secret garden, and by that means she feels she's forged a bond with another bereaved mother. Anselma, whose marriage was not destroyed by the bereavements and who had a surviving child in the end, was perhaps more able to find meaning and value in her life post-bereavement something for which Maria is still searching at the time of writing. So in conclusion, by the time we finish reading this novel, it has become clear that a mother's bereavement and the fear of it are as painful as they always have been, and that mother blame and guilt for making bad choices, however irrational, are still a particularly distressing part of that, as they always have been too. Our choices may revolve around different kinds of decisions and our confessors may be doctors now rather than priests, but that antique sense of sole personal responsibility for the children we bear, with the guilt and self-blame which that entails when they're less than perfect, always in other words, seems to have made little if any progress since Mary Shelley was exploring it almost two centuries ago in Frankenstein, and there's my one and only Gothic mention. <laughs> <laughs>